Sonnenstrahlen. Sarem? Uh, good afternoon. It's uh, my greatest pleasure to be here uh, among my uh, dearest colleagues and esteemed professors. Many, many thanks for your very kind invitation. So it has been over 15 years now, and I'm back home. Very special thanks to my friend, colleague, role model, and previous mentor. Dr. Ahudat Moon. I really owe you a lot. Without her, I wouldn't have been in my position. So thank you very much. So it's SUDEP awareness today. And our um, objectives are to look into the incidence and the risk factors for the SUDEP. And the various proposed pathophysiological mechanisms will try to simplify it as much as possible go through the practical and clinical implications because we hate physiology and we need to know how does this reflect to our daily clinical practice? What could be the future directions? And at the end, just to remove the dullness of this topic, um, we'll have a case discussion and we will have some quizzes and you, we will open a, a polling vote so we see how we have perceived the topic today. So, SUDEP, we don't like it, do we? And we don't want to talk about it. And why do we avoid it? It's a very uneasy topic. We don't understand what's happening. It's very rare, so we think that if it's rare, why do I need to bother myself? Why do I need to bother the patients with it? Why do I create unnecessary anxiety and there is no definite treatment for it, so what's the point? So Daniel Fredman and a team of uh, colleagues uh, in the United States and uh, Canada, they published um, an article on uh, a, way, a web based survey that they have conducted. Uh, and they've sent this web uh, survey to 17,558 neurologists, pediatricians, and pediatric neurologists. And whoever have responded were only 9.3%. So that's an appalling um, feedback. So in their question, in their survey questions, they looked uh, in, uh, into the frequency of pseudo discussion. How frequent do... Um, physicians feel like they would like to discuss this topic. And as we can see, a total of 42% would rarely discuss it or never discuss it. Uh, then we have a minority who will be discussing it at all times, not really a minority, but about 20%, so one in five. And this part are the people sitting on the bench. They neither agree nor disagree, so they they just hang around and see how the, um, the boat will take them. So then we move on to the definitions and the criteria. Lina Nashif and her team in 2011 have defined the uh, SUDEP and the criteria for the SUDEP is that it's sudden, it's unexpected, whether witnessed or unwitnessed, it has to be non-traumatic and non-droning and with or without seizure, but with exclusion of status epilepticus. And the post-mortem examination does not reveal any structural or toxicological case. So far, this is the definition that is adopted till date. They further looked into the how to further classify. So they mentioned definite SUDEP or definite SUDEP plus. The definite SUDEP is when the post-mortem examination uh, does not reveal a cause, and the definite pseudo plus if there is a concomitant disease, but this concomitant disease has not led directly to the death. P probable pseudo or probable pseudo plus is when we don't have an autopsy, and the possible pseudo is when we have a, co um, a competing cause near pseudo if the patient survives resuscitation for more than one hour without a structurally identifiable cause and not SUDEP at all or unclassified. So 
Epidemiology and Risk Factor, that's the um, work of the American Academy of Neurologists along with the American Epilepsy Society. And they looked into the incidence of SUDEP and they found that it is um, in childhood with a moderate degree of confidence, 0.22 per thousand per year. So not 0.22 per thousand all over the time. No, it's per thousand per year. So therefore the recommendation is that any pediatrician or a pediatric neurologist looking after a child with epilepsy should discuss SUDEP at one point. They then looked into the most concerning risk factors and clearly the most concerning of them all is the frequency of the generalized tonic-clonic seizures. And all other high risk factors are, is any, are anything that relates to the generalized tonic-clonic seizure occurrence or poor management. Other alternative risk factors but that, are found, that were found but with rather lower confidence were the nocturnal seizures never been treated with anti-epileptic drugs or being on polypharmacology, if there is intellectual disability or if it's a male gender. Pathophysiological mechanisms. So we have very legitimate questions, compelling ones. Why only some seizures lead to SUDEP? Why not everybody would die from SUDEP if they have the same risk factors? Why we have some prolonged uncontrolled seizures that lead to SUDEP and others do not. Then a team of um, pediatric neurologists have in uh, 2018 reviewed all what's found in literature till that date. And they came up or they proposed four pathophysiological mechanisms. These are the brainstem arousal dysfunction, the neurotransmitters and the neuromodulators roles, uh, cardiac arrhythmias and respiratory dysfunction. So this is the slide which basically summarizes the whole pathophysiology in one part. So a seizure triggered by internal factors. These internal factors are the genetics or the poor seizure control. What does it lead to? A cortical spread and a subcortical spread. The cortical spread would stimulate eventually the reticulothalamic reticulothalamic cortical pathway that would lead to post-ectal generalized EEG suppression. And we will look into this. And the subcortical suppression would lead into a post-ectal suppression of the brainstem function and post-ectal suppression of the medullary function. So the post-ectal suppression of the brain function will affect the arousal system of the brain stem. The medullary dysfunction will lead to respiratory center dysfunction and cardiovascular center dysfunction. We need serotonin and adenosine and it's playing a role that is controversial at the moment. So the cardiovascular dysfunction leads to cardiac arrhythmias the respiratory and the brainstem arousal will lead to respiratory dysfunction with hypoventilation, apnea, uh, and all processes are interlinked along with external factors as position and delayed in resuscitation will lead to SUDA. So what's the post-actal generalized EEG suppression? So this is defined by um, sorry. This is defined by uh, Elisa Bruno and Mark Richardson uh, from the King's College, and it is published in 2020. This is defined as the suppression of electrical activity below 10 volts, allowing for some muscle and movement uh, artifacts that take place three to five seconds post-actually. And what is the proposed mechanism? So when there is a seizure going between both sides, the cortex, this stimulates the cortical corticothalamic pathway. So the thalamus is now stimulated. Then the stimulated thalamus would send signals to the cortex and to the reticular formation. The reticular nuclei then become activated 
and starts to do all the good job of inhibition of the seizure. With this inhibition, there is not only termination of the seizure, but also there is dampening of the response with delayed in the arousal and the occurrence of the post-actal EEG suppression. All what we know at the moment is that the PGES is linked to SUDEP in one way or another. Its duration, we don't know whether being longer matters. We still, lots of work needs to be done. We found that it is of a lower prevalence in children, but obviously there is very limited research on um, SUDEP in children, and there is a great variability and intra-individual variability. So within the same person, or within a group of patients. We find most of our pseudo patients taking some form or another where there is basically a suffocation. This is the position that they found in many patients with pseudo, and this affects the um, head repositioning and the oxygenation. Neurotransmitters play a role, but the exact role is still to be uh, explored. We know that the serotonin stimulates arousal and adenosine is an inhibitory neuromodulatory agent. So serotonin, when it's depleted, there is a prolonged hypoventilation and there is apnea. So, and study on adult population found that there is a reduction in the post-actal hypoxemia if we give the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So the question here, would selective uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors one day pose um, a preventive role in SUDEP? Adenosine is highly controversial at the moment. Most of the work done is, were on mice models, and it has a paradoxical effect. So still work to be done. Cardiac dysfunction, and this is uh, a work done by Netherlands, uh, Germany, and UK, looking into the various cardiac dysfunction and arrhythmia patterns in uh, um, patients with, um, with SUDEP. They found that most of the SUDEP cases, if not all, happen with the post-actal arrhythmias, and bradyarrhythmias tend to be more happening than the tachyarrhythmias. So, we see seven out of 13 died from asystole, two from AV block, and two from AF, and three cases from VF and VT. Mortimer's study is a very convincing piece of work that has been done by uh, Professor Revelin and his team and published in The Lancet in um, 2013. And it really looked into, it, it's, it's an extensive piece of work. They looked into patients from 1968 till 2007. So it's over four decades. They included 160 epilepsy monitoring units from New Zealand, Australia, Europe, and Israel. They wanted really to, to explore what are the possible mechanisms and they wanted to calibrate the role of the respiratory and the cardiac dysfunction in the occurrence of SUDEP. They recruited 29 cases, 16 of definite and probable, near SUDEP 9 and others, where four, they analyzed the video EEG recordings, the respiratory pattern and the ECG. So this is an extensive piece of work. And their results is that all SUDEP and near fatal SUDEP happened at night. 14 out of 18 were happening in prone position. CRP was done after 10 minutes in those who died and less than three minutes in those who survived. So the earlier we resuscitate, the likely the child will survive. They found four consistent features. In the immediate post-actal state, they see tachycardia and um, uh, tachypnea. This is fo followed by what we've uh, seen, the PGES. This is followed by three minutes post actually when all the problems really start. Bradycardia and asystole followed by apnea that if persists, goes into the terminal stage of apnea and asystole. So it starts at three minutes. If we don't intervene at this point, then the outcome is lower.
And that's that's what they have reported is that there is initially there is an intermittent asystole. So it starts with this is a three minutes. We start here uh, with asystole and bradycardia, followed by apnea, then followed afterwards by the terminal apnea and the terminal asystole, which is the red part. So cardiovascular respiratory, respiratory cardiovascular. Gene mutations. In 2013, Devensky and his team defined um, a gene, a pseudop gene as a gene, as a pathogenic variant that can lead to epilepsy, increases the risk of pseudop, and it has to be expressed in the brain and the heart. There are various genes that have been identified so far. The ones that are marked are the ones that I personally have seen uh, across the, uh, the past 10 years uh, where I work. So clinical and practical aspects, is there a way to reduce the pseudop? Are there any medications that we can give now to stop the pseudop? And what are the role of protective devices? What are we going to tell the parents and when are we going to counsel them? And I am pretty sure that in our society here, it's even harder discussion than in the UK. So effective seizure management, the presence and the frequency of generalized tonic-clonic seizures is the most important risk factor for pseudop in both children and adults. And effective control of seizures, either by anti-epileptic drugs or by epilepsy surgery will reduce the occurrence or is likely to reduce the, the occurrence. So our goal as clinicians is to reduce the seizure burden. We need to set up realistic targets and expectations use appropriate medication polytherapy. We have to look into the various mechanisms of the medications that we are using and avoid certain medications that will worsen uh, some seizure types. Early access ketogenic diet is very important. Referral for, for VNS, and again, access to VNS and referral to epilepsy surgery. So because we know that most of the pseudop cases happen at night time, if not all, the nocturnal supervision can offer um, a reduced risk to the occurrence of seizures. And what's, what's the current evidence? And there have been really a, a robust evolution in the uh, development of electronic devices, smart watches, mobile stuff. So the question is, can we use that? So the, the NICE, uh, National Institute of Clinical Excellence um, gathered the, this new evidence review that has been published in 2022 or updated in 2022, looking into the various new technologies, its uh, clinical and cost effectiveness. They looked into 821 papers. The only, there were only two that were of a good research criteria and design. And therefore, it's extremely difficult to make a recommendation on these bases, but they came up with medicine adherence and reduction of seizures are the main parameters which reduce or likely to reduce the seizure, the uh, pseudop at this point. And diverse opinions were there, like the ones we're going to have now. And they agreed that there is a great potential, but too much work is still to be done. Then when they've done a survey to the caregivers, what do they want? They want everything. They want monitors rather than missing a seizure. They want the neurologist to be able to counsel them what's the best. They want a monitor that will be able to pick everything and they want to be able to interact with their child. So that's, that's too much of an ask. So what are our future directions? To start with, I think we need to start removing the emotional barrier with SUDEP. We need to increase the awareness. We need to look into more epidemiological studies, do more work uh, and review what, what happened uh, with pediatric age group and more research is needed in epilepsy care units. So, what does the future hold for us? Maybe seizure diaries that are tailored to each individual patient, is not all patients are the same. Individual prediction tools, so some prediction tools that the likelihood for pseudop in this particular patient, what, what's, what is it gonna be? Machine learning prediction tools also. 
seizure detection devices, lots of an, a lot of an ask. The, the epilepsy monitoring units play a very important role in the accurate highlighting of the various pathophysiological mechanisms of SUDEP and possibly working on selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and other adenosine. This is adopted from, the, from a very recent article that has been recently published. So I finished this part of the talk. We'll go into the clinical part. Yes, in less than five minutes. I'll be over. Um, so I want you to start reading through this case and we will do just a few questions. So this is in a pediatric, pediatric neurology clinic. This is your first appointment with a baby and parents referred from a general pediatrician, a 12 month old developmentally normal infant had two episodes of febrile convulsive status epilepticus at the age of six and seven months, each lasting for, uh, I'm sorry, this is 45 minutes, and needing escalation of treatment and PICU admission, and parents did not provide exact semiology. So, no family history, Pediatrician started the patient on valproate and the patient is currently on 30 milligrams per kilo. Following that, the, the baby had two subsequent short febrile seizures lasting for 10 minutes. EEG and MRI at the age of one year is normal. Okay, so we'll start our session with VVox Learning. Would you please scan this or download the VVox app? Hmm? <laughs> هنقول ال questions verbal ولا إيه؟ لا verbal إيه حضرتك ما فيش verbal هي will start the open poll. So the first question. I have a question. Relates to this patient. Okay. So what investigation would you like to consider to the baby? Um, genetics, video, both. All right, okay, let's stop. What do you think? So we can see that 25% said video telemetry, 58% said normal, 8% said genetics. What do you think? Genetics. Okay, so early onset, for brine status epilepticus, we have to consider lasting for 45 minutes, needing PCCU, we need to consider SCN1. Would we do video telemetry? The question is, if the baby doesn't have seizures, what are we exactly aiming for? 
24 hours or 48 hours, no seizure, it's again interactive. <laughs> okay, I will, I will, I will, all right. So question two. Do you want to add any invest? No. Do you want any medication? Yes or no, or you're not sure? Okay. Brilliant. So everybody wants to add. Great. So then comes the second, the following question. Reopen the poll. What do you want to add? Two febrile status at the age of six and seven months. Is on valproate. Do you want to add any other medication? Okay. That's that's quite an interesting. Is that the fine? Shall we stop? Okay. So there are. We have to be very cautious if we're suspecting Dravet's. Now it's the recommendation polytherapy. So you will be starting something with the valproate while you're conducting the genetic test. If the genetic test comes positive, then fer 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 it's okay. But if the genetic test comes negative, then you will weigh, does it still fit into the Dravase or I am happy to start withdrawing this medication? Definitely, we wouldn't be giving a medication that will worsen the seizures. And in sodium channelopathies, we avoid the lamotrigine. So the treatment of choice is the clobazam. To pyramate. <laughs> so do you need to discuss the pseudop in the first consultation? Yes or no? Brilliant. OK. Only seven voted, my God. Some more. <laughs> Not sure. Okay. I will just very quickly share my experience. This is a baby that I have seen in my clinic. Exactly. This is, this is actually the baby. Have had the genetic test done and follow up four weeks down the line. Three weeks down the line, the baby died with Sudap. So parents should be counseled with for Sudep, okay? If you suspect Dravet's, you cannot predict what will happen. And you don't, and actually the genetics came after the baby died with a variant of unclear significance. It wasn't even at this point of time realized that this is a pathogenic variant. If you want to discuss, to discuss SUREP, what would be your, the reasons? Is it because the baby is at an increased risk or is it always a good practice or because of the, com, of the com, uh, convulsive status epilepticus or because the baby was started on regular treatment? Only one, three, four, six. Okay. So because you're suspecting Dravet's, then this is a baby who has an increased likelihood of having Sudep. So baby is at an increased risk, or you think that the baby is at an increased risk, so you will discuss the Sudep. We finished the case, and this is a very recap one. So to diagnose Sudep or Sudep plus, would you need a post-mortem examination or you wouldn't need a post-mortem examination? <laughs> Only two, three, four, okay, five, six. So yes, we need post-mortem examination for definite SUDEP and 
pseudo plus, but probably you don't need. And I think this is probably what's gonna be done more in the Egyptian culture. Pseudo affects 0.2% of children with epilepsy, 0.5%, 1% or none of the above. Okay, brilliant. So it is none of the above because it affects 0.22 per thousand per year. What is the most important risk factor? What is the most important risk factor for SUDEP? Occurrence of nocturnal seizures, frequency of GTCs, genetic, never been treated, male gender, intellectual disability, all of the above. Brilliant. Frequency of generalized tonic-clonic seizures is the most important risk factor at the moment. What is or are the proposed earliest predictor of SUDEP? Yes, brilliant. So it is post-actal EEG suppression is the earliest predictor of SUDEP at the moment, or what we think is the earliest predictor, but lots of work still to be done. What are the most frequent SUDEP-related arrhythmias? Actal tachyarrhythmias, post-actal bradyarrhythmias, both or none of the above. You're excellent, and I, I think we've managed to really do well. So yes, the, the answer is the post-actal bradyarrhythmias, as we've seen, is the uh, most frequent pseudoprelated arrhythmia. So the Mortimus study, this is three minutes post-actal cardiorespiratory dis dysfunction, um, is, has shown transient bradycardia, transient asystole, transient apnea followed by terminal apnea and terminal asystole or transient tachycardia, transient asystole, terminal apnea and terminal asystole. Dr. Maham, I need time. خلاص. احنا دي one minute, one more minute. So the answer here, I had only one. So it starts with transient bradycardia followed by transient asystole followed by tachypnea, followed by terminal tachypnea, uh, terminal apnea, sorry, and terminal asystole. So yes, it's number one. Genes that are related to epilepsy, sodium channel genes, long QT, calcium, mutation genes, all of the above, or A plus B. Yeah, okay. Anyone else wants to vote? Only five? Yes, it's A plus B. It's the sodium channel genes and the long QT interval uh, mutation genes. Last question. What is the most important risk factor management? Careful monitoring of nocturnal seizures, effective management of convulsive seizures, raising awareness, use of selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or all of the above. Yeah, it's effective management of convulsive seizures. And thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Amaya, for your interesting talk. I have a very short comment. You mentioned uh, that prevention of SUDIP is regular uh, and compliance or adherence to anti-epileptic drugs. You didn't mention 
the most important risk factor or the most important observation which occurred frequently with Sudeep is the prone position. Prone position uh, occurred in 14, you tell that's prone position to prevent prone position, especially in epileptic. You, you mentioned it? Okay, thank you. As the fee hadith on a resort of Allah Salam, who had this high a carahit in noom ala el bat with a good man al for bamit sana. Let the lana sodden the dama crew had to come and done the causes of sudden infant death syndrome, el brum position. Thank you. أنا أنا أتحدث بالي هو قال لك روم بزش. شكرا شكرا جزيلا. وI hope إن أنا ما اللي إحنا كده we finished with this session and then we shift to the last session. جامع. Before the last ولا last last. Thank you very much. شكرا. Thank you.